in South Korea. After graduation from the university, he worked in the media as a producer, director, and breakfast show host at a private radio uh, station, as well as a producer for the Fiji Ministry of Information. His career at the Methodist Church in Fiji started in 2006, uh, and he still is the Minister for Religion. It's worth to note that in 2016, the Methodist Church of Fiji changed its mandate and began accepting female ministers in an effort to create more awareness on gender equality. His areas of advocacy are in climate justice, with particular emphasis on the ocean, that makes sense coming from Fiji and the Pacific Islands, uh, gender equality, self-determination, ecumenism, and interreligious dialogue. So Reverend James Bagwan will be talking about the theological aspects of gender-based violence. Yeah? And our second speaker is Dr. Dula Shatar, who has a very impressive CV. He's the Emeritus Professor of the Department of Criminology, School of Arts, Media, and Management at Sarunaya Institute of Technology and Sciences in Coimbatore, and I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, and forgive me for my uh, pronunciation. Her responsibilities include teaching, research, and extension activities with special focus on collaborative research. She was a former, she, she was formerly a professor and head of the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice Sciences from uh, Manonmanyam, Sundarana University, and is also the co-coordinator of, of the UGC-sponsored program, uh, Victimology and Victim Assistance and the Human Rights and Duties Education. She is also the director for Center for Empowerment and Women's Studies at MSU, and the special officer for um, RTI, CM Cell, and Local Fund Audit. The thrust area of all her work is public affairs and social issues. Her research concentrates on the inequalities in various areas, increasing the vulnerabilities and denying access to justice to excluded groups like women, Dalit, children, transgender persons, victims of crime, and abuse of power. She significantly focuses on developing partnerships between uh, researchers policymakers, program developers, agency personnel, and other community groups. Through this partnership, she, she conducts basic and applied research and evaluation in issues of sociological concerns and the many different facets of victimology, crime, criminology, law, and justice. Uh, she holds degrees in women's studies, psychology, education management, human rights, victimology, counseling, and law. And she also has served as a research guide and examiner in various universities and guides master's degrees in science, art, uh, master's in philosophy, and a PhD scholar. She's involved in the training of the police and the judiciary in the concept of victimology to fill the gaps in services to victims of the crime in the criminal justice system in India. She has completed five major projects funded by the University Grants Commission, Indian Council of Social Science Research, the Bureau of Police and Research, Police Research and Development, and uh, the United Kingdom in India Educational Research Initiative, and has coordinated, uh, coordinated skill-based training programs for the criminal justice professionals all over India. She was the first to introduce a standalone victimology course in India in 2008 and that brings the victimology courses into the postgraduate diploma and master of philosophy through the UGC Innovative Program. She has published her research work widely in national and international journals and has been invited to present her research findings in Australia, Hong Kong, Kenya, Japan, United Kingdom, Portugal, Switzerland, Indonesia, Taiwan, Canada, Netherlands, Sweden, and a few other countries. She was on deputation from the University 
University to the YWCA of India as the National General Secretary, heading 85 local associations all over India. She has served as a member of national consultations on various reforms and evaluation of the legislation and the working of the criminal justice system. She has been invited as an individual expert at the 12th United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice in Brazil and is part of the delegation of the World Society of Victimology in the Crime Commission at Vienna in May 2011 as well as the UN Preparatory Meeting at, uh, in Costa Rica in February 2014. She was awarded the prestigious Indo-Hungarian Fellowship in 2010 and was a visiting researcher of the University of Montreal in 2011. She also the recipient of Commonwealth Academic Staff Fellowship uh, in 2013 and as a full and a Fulbright Fellowship in 2014. She's a recipient of 2015 uh and, and has worked in the john jay college of criminal justice in new york from 20 from november 2014 and has been a rece recipient of the prestigious award from the indian S society of victimology in 2014 and from the indian society of criminology in 2018. so she has been invited to organize a panel discussion in the 14th united nations congress um, Hold on. Uh, on um, crime prevention and criminal justice in in Japan in 2020 on the topic of uh, access to justice initiatives, involvement, innovation, and institutional uh, and institutional innovations and in involvement and in, in innovation. Um, and her responsibilities include teaching, research, and extension activities with special focus on collaborative research. Um, so now let's welcome Reverend Jean. And um, we can hear you speak now. I'll turn it over to you, Reverend James Bagwan. Thank you very much, Saira, and uh, thank you to Belinda and uh, my esteemed uh, colleague who will be uh, speaking after me. Um, I begin by acknowledging the mothers and sisters in my uh, life journey. I come from a, a very strong feminist family, and so uh, I quite uh, enjoy these opportunities to engage on this issue. Um, although it is a sad reality that there is still much work to be done, on the issue of gender justice. Um, as we go th through the 16 days of activism here in the Pacific, we actually uh, start to um, our journey in terms of the churches um, a few days before, the Sunday immediately prior to the 16 days of activism, which uh, this year I believe was the 22nd of November, is known as Break the Silence Sunday. Um, and we uh, we, uh, we, we observe this Break the Silence Sunday in our churches to ensure that as we uh, prepare for uh, um, the 16 days, something that is uh, commemorated within civil society, some government, and some faith communities and faith-based organizations, it's important for us to um, engage in the church from the pulpits uh, with our communities on the issue of gender-based violence. And here in the Pacific part of Asia Pacific, um, that's quite important because of, over 90% of the Pacific uh, Islands population identify themselves as Christian or coming from a Christian spiritual uh, background and a Christian spiritual worldview. Now, um, that means that when we engage on any issue in our region or our sub-region uh, in this uh, context uh, for Asia Pacific, um, the role of the church and the role of uh, faith leaders is very important as agents of social transformation. And also, if we are going to do our theology, and I've been asked to share this, um, a, a theological reflection, um, today, uh, it's important that our theology not be done with our backs to the suffering of the 
people that we are pastorally responsible for. And so we begin uh, our theology with the lived reality in the Pacific. And I start with Fiji and then move into the Pacific, where Fiji's police force uh, this year, up until the end of October, recorded 1,500 cases of violence against women. That's a population of less than a million. Um, these included murder, attempted murder, manslaughter, infanticide, and physical assault. There were another 99 cases of sexual offenses and 1,644 cases of crimes against women and reported that children were the victims of 573 uh, of these crimes. Last year, 10 women were killed as a result of partner violence in Fiji. Um, and we have one of the highest rates of gender-based violence in the world uh, at 72% of all women being impacted by some sort of violence in their lifetime. And these high rates are often attributed to, to patriarchal beliefs about the role of women in society and religious traditions and communities that leave it up to families to reconcile disputes. In the Pacific, broadly, um, we, we find these uh, harmful and criminal behavior faced by women from domestic violence, rape, harassment, etc. cetera. Um, and so we find that approximately two thirds of the female population in the Pacific have experienced some form of gender-based violence. So that is the reality in which we begin our engagement of this issue as, as churches. And as churches, as a result of the work that we have been doing, we have confessed our negative contribution to the structural violence enacted upon women of all ages and social status in the women. Patriarchal structures of leadership and decision-making, the biblical interpretation and attitudes towards women in faith communities, which have underpinned the psychological, emotional, physical, sexual, and economic violence that Pacific women have had to endure. And so we have and we continue to painfully acknowledge the abuse of power and trust experienced by women and children in our Pacific churches, and that there are places where the gospel of love, the gospel of inclusion and preference for the least among us in society and of peace and abundant life for all is preached and is held out as the ideal, but it is not practiced. Our Pacific uh, Conference of Churches General Assembly uh, just two years ago, the same assembly in which I was elected as, um, as General Secretary, um, affirmed their condemnation of all forms of violence against women and children, calling it a sin and calling on the Christian community in the Pacific to ensure the dignity of our women and children being protected at all times. We've had... Uh, church leaders now speaking out and calling violence against women and children as a sin. And that our faith, and uh, this is a campaign that we were able to run with uh, all the diverse faiths in our Fiji Island community, that all of our faiths say no to rape and violence against women and children. We've uh, affirmed the need also for equitable representation of women in church leadership, and um, having said that, we, we recognize the important role of, um, of, of women in leadership. And so I just want to correct one thing in the introduction. The Methodist Church in Fiji um, has, um, for the last um, 50 years uh, now, um, included women in ordination or the ordination of women. Uh, what it's done since 2016 is broaden that definition to recognize the deaconess order, which has many more women in uh, a separate form of ordained ministry as ordained deaconesses, as holding equal status as ordained clergy. This means when we have ministerial sessions of meetings, both female ministers and deaconesses are also included in that, um, in that process. Here at PCC, the Pacific Conference of Churches, we've already had two women general secretaries. And in our constitution, 
um, it ensures that either the moderator or the deputy moderator must be a woman. So if uh, the moderator is a man, the deputy moderator is a woman. If the moderator is a woman, then the deputy is a male. Um, the challenge now, of course, is how we bring these things into national and local church leadership. Um, why am I giving this preface? Well, because the theological uh, reflection out of the many that we could have in this short amount of time, I would just like to focus on one of the basics. And because I find that uh, this particular reflection that I'm going to share really can be placed at the root of uh, patriarchy and gender injustice that we see together today. And so I begin with some misconceptions. Misconceptions are that man is superior and woman is inferior, that woman is not equal to or with man, that only men is, man is created in the image of God, and that woman or women only have access to God's image through men, and that woman had the image of God, but this image was lost when she ate the uh, forbidden fruit, and that women can regain this image through her husband in, and through marriage. So again, these are misconceptions that I will be talking about. Other misconceptions are that women are only created as helpers to the men, and they don't occupy the same level as men. And because a woman is created from the rib of the man, she is inferior to men. And the wife, being a woman, must always submit to her husband and not the other way around. And that the wife is meant for the home and the home for the wife. These are many misconceptions and ways in which uh, theology and biblical scriptures have been misinterpreted to promote patriarchy and to promote the, the devaluation and the uh, um, uh, inequality of women in our homes and in our communities. These force us to address some very deep questions of faith. What does God or what would God say about the, the abuse of and violence against fellow human beings? Do our interpretations of the Bible uphold and advance God's original vision of the equality and dignity of both men and women, female and male? And what, what must we do with our interpretation and beliefs that deny God-given equality and dignity? And then what was must we do with our cultures that set women lower than men? So often what we find is that we have cultures that place women lower than men, and we use our theology or we misuse our theology to justify this. So in that sense, what is gender equality about? It's about recognizing and affirming and respecting the dignity of women and their equality with men as given by God. It's about removing the barriers which hinder women from reclaiming the place of dignity and of equality, which God intended from the beginning. Ensuring that women have opportunities to enjoy abundant life. And it's about men letting go of their pride and their iron grip to control over so many things and allowing themselves to be on the same level alongside women as God had intended for us at the very beginning. Where do I get all of this from? Well, right at the beginning of the Bible, in the context of First Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, and I'll just share it from the New Revised Standard Version. The passage reads, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Of course, uh, in the context of self-determination and decolonization, there is a need to unpack the word dominion, but that is not the conversation for today. 
Today we are talking about humankind, male and female, made in the image and likeness of God equally. We have to remember that um, Genesis was written or compiled in a world that was ruled and run by men. It was a patriarchal world and societies were dominated and ruled by men. In that system, a woman had no life of her own. She was a property and possession of a male head, father, then husband, then eldest son, should the father die. And this patriarchal system existed and was practiced in eastern Mesopotamia long before Israel came to be. So when Israel became a people, it was powerless against the system. And so they, Israel adopted and adapted the system to be its own. And this is evidenced through the many stories and passages of the Old Testament. At the same time, the Old Testament also contains stories and passages which tells of God's good and noble intentions for humanity, both men and women, male and female. And this passage that I've shared from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, and you can go on to verse 31, records God's original and noble vision and intention for humanity. Whatever the situation is or may be that we face in life, this story tells us that we belong to God and that we, men and women, bear God's image in equal measure and that we live to carry out God. God's vision and dream for the earth. So to be human and treated as human is the birthright of every woman, man, boy, and girl created in God's image. This birthright goes across and beyond cultures and contexts, and this right is endowed by God only, and not by any human being or culture or religion. So being male and female a part and parcel of being human must be affirmed, respected, celebrated, and practiced. So we find male and female created equal and different. Both have dignity and equality rooted in God. Both man and woman are entrusted with the same and equal responsibility to care for God's creation. And this commands and Im implies a delegated power that is given equally to man and woman. And as I mentioned about the word dominion, it is not to dominate, but in this sense, the word dominion is about stewardship and care or custodianship. So both male and female are called to be custodians of God's creation, to be stewards of God's creation. Both male and female share alike in the blessing and responsibility of procreation, be fruitful and multiply. And so procreation from that perspective is both a right and a responsibility shared between the male and female. And so sexual intercourse is meant to be a mutual, intimate relationship, not a relationship where the man is the dominant one and the woman the passive one. And here we recognize that there is no room for rape or any other form of sexual abuse. At the end of the Genesis creation text in first Genesis, Genesis chapter one, verse 31, God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. So both male and female are included in everything which God has declared as very good. So no person, no culture, no religion, no theology, etc., has the right to belittle or inferiorize another human being whom God has called as very good. So the challenge is for us when we go through the scriptures to recognize the times where we are misinterpreting the scriptures. And this, of course, is a challenge for us because in recognizing the innate integral equality of male and female as created by God. The question is, why then are we allowing these things to continue? And the challenge is for us to recognize our patriarchal interpretation 
and the cultural biases and prejudices that have been ingrained and that we bring along in that process. So in the Pacific, what we are trying to do is a process that we call gender equality theology, where we address some of these biblical texts that are used to um, make women feel or see, be seen as inferior. And we challenge those texts, again, using a interpretation of the Bible or helping people interpret that correctly. But ultimately, whether we are talking from um, the, uh, the books of uh, the, the letters of Paul to the Ephesians, which is an often quoted, uh, misquoted text, or others, we bring it right back to the beginning, to God's intention, that we are intended to be created equal. And so when we engage in this work, we must recognize that there is a need for equity because we have to redress some of that inequality that we have perpetuated for so long. So thank you for your time. I know um, uh, we are running behind time, so I will, I will wrap this up and, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to engage in a theological conversation and uh, I look forward to other opportunities to do so. Menaka, thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend James. Um, let's go first to a question and answer. If you have any question for Reverend James, because he has to leave um, soon. Um, so if you have any questions, you can do so now by raising your hands or putting it in chat. Thank you. No questions? Wow. No questions yet. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Reverend James. That was a very inspiring talk. And I never heard uh, Genesis. No, I've always heard Genesis as being man, a woman, women inferior to men. And this is the first time that I've heard and it puts it in a different perspective of, 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 of equality, of gender equality. Um, so if we have, we don't have any questions, and I will synthesize this later when we, upon, upon closing of what, what has been discussed. Let's proceed to uh, Dr. Gula Shekhar. Um, Saira, there is a question from Jacinta. Uh, she writes, uh, thank you, Reverend. What kind of reception has this change in messaging received from male church leaders? Um, this, uh, this, this is, this is quite an interesting process. So when we engage, uh, in this, in this work, and here I would really like to uh, acknowledge the, the partnership that we have with, uh, Uniting Church in Australia through, um, through, uh, Act Alliance member Uniting World. Um, the, the work that, that we do is, is engaging in these things through Bible studies. And recognizing the mutual responsibility that we have in our communities. And often um, there is a process where the barriers go up because we are challenging, um, challenging people. But as, as we have the process of reflection, um, we start to see the changes. And that is why I was sharing earlier that, uh, you know, uh, we've been able to have campaigns um, across our Pacific Island countries, where we have uh, male church leaders, as well as some female church leaders, but predominantly male church leaders coming out and saying that violence against women and children is a sin, and affirming the uh, equal dignity of, uh, of men and women. Um, and, and, and recognizing that. So it's been a slow process. But um, that is really because we are calling people to to rethink and recheck uh, what their basic assumptions that they sometimes have even grown up with and been ingrained in their culture. Uh, but that process, as we unpack it theologically, and of course, uh, we take a little bit more time than a 20-minute presentation to do so, um, but that process has been welcomed by, by church leaders. Thank you again, Reverend James. Um, should we proceed now, or are there any other questions? Um, no other questions at the moment. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Jing. So now let's go to um, Dr. Bula uh, Shekhar. A very good day to all of you. I can't say afternoon, I can't say morning, I can't say evening because they're all over the place. So it's great to be here today with all of you. And uh, uh, thanks to Reverend Bhagwan for setting the stage for this very important webinar. So a very important concept from the Bible. He linked very beautifully to our uh, 18, uh, 16 days of activism here. So strengthening gender justice in the Asia-Pacific region. I'd like to talk about the role of faith-based organizations like all of us, Act Alliance especially. So I'd like to begin with a quote. All that is necessary for triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And a huge thank you to Act Alliance for true to its name. It acts on all the 365 days, 24-7 and round the clock challenging gender-based violence and taking the initiative to put together this webinar to mark the 16 days of activism and strengthening gender justice. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, let's begin like the little children do always, asking these five pertinent questions, the five W's and the one H that I call. What is our role as faith-based organizations in strengthening gender justice. Let's see why is it crucial that we intervene now and we need to know where to begin and when do we respond and which are the areas in which we can work as faith-based organizations. And finally, the one hate, how can we orange the world? The UN uh, team is oranging the world. So um, let's, uh, let me uh, draw your attention to this old Yiddish proverb. It states that God cannot be everywhere and so he created mother. In developing countries, if this could be re-articulated and read as the government cannot be and is not everywhere. So the need for faith-based organizations, for civil societies, for non-profit organizations and non-governmental organizations like us. So we have a crucial role to play as watchdogs and guardians of this system. So before we begin, we uh, need to see, we do a kind of SWOT analysis to see where we stand as faith-based organizations. What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are our opportunities? And what are our threats? So let's look at our strengths first. There is a huge networking of all our organizations. We share our resources. And there is now uh, this, uh, uh, tryst with the gender-based violence is strengthened with a global commitment, first with the MDGs, the Millennium Developmental Goals, and now with the SDGs. And we also have legislation in place because of the commitment to these uh, sustainable developmental goals. Even in uh, developing countries, you see that there are lots of legislation. So this is the right time for us to dive in and see what we can do as faith-based organizations. And looking at our weaknesses, lack of awareness of the laws. Uh, we generally seem to assume that law is for lawyers and we do not want to get involved with that, but we need to. And we also um, need to know what our role is in these legislations. We do not know that, we are not aware of that. And of course, training our uh, members, our, our staff to uh, understand what these legislations mean and what is the role of the faith-based organizations, what is the role of the civil society. So we need to kind of move from the uh, work that we were doing earlier with the, uh, the charity and the developmental mode into a right-based uh, mode. So we need to adopt, we need to adapt, and we need to improve. So these are the areas where we need to strengthen ourselves. And threats, of course, are... Uh, being organization-centric, these are the victim-centric. So our goal should be to help the people who need this help. And because it is their right, and we just need to be there to handhold and uh, strengthen their uh, 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 fight as they move through from becoming a victim to survivor. So there, there is a huge struggle. So we need to understand that and focus on what the needs of the uh, people we work with are, really. 
and we need to and sometimes we're too rigid in our approach and sometimes we're too flexible so these are kind of seen as threats we're too rigid uh, in our approach in certain ways and then too flexible and we bend to pressure especially when you live in a political setup so there is a lot of things that's happening in our country as well as maybe in other developing countries now with the uh, uh, political uh, pressure on the uh, faith-based organizations and the NGOs as well. So uh, looking at our opportunities, we have a global platform for action now and technology which we have now we never had before is a good way to network and to reach out to the people and to uh, spread the word and to see uh, what we can do getting things from the technology. It is a boon to our work if you uh, understand how to use technology. And uh, we see that the perpetrators of the laws, the criminals are abusing technology. They use technology for trafficking or uh, sexual abuse and things like that. So we need to uh, uh, reconstruct that nexus and we need to take over and we need to use that opportunity to help us with our work. So these are the uh, uh, strengths, weaknesses, and uh, uh, threats like we see. And now moving on to uh, how do we strengthen this gender justice? We need to be, as faith-based organizations, proactive vis-a-vis -vis reactive. So we see that uh, there is need always. We tend to um, address the issue and react only after it happens. So we see how... Uh, the traffickers, we did a study on how the traffickers, the mode of operandi that they use in small villages in South India. So we saw that these traffickers were uh, very clever and they did it, they operated very smoothly. They went to school and they got the list of uh, dropouts from the school. And with this list, they went to these houses where these children who had dropped out of school lived. And then they spoke to the parents and uh, assured them of a good future and a good salary for these children. And that is the way they uh, set the base before they could traffic these children. So, and there are things like these so-called honor killings that happen now in India as well. So that again is another area where we are just uh, reactive. We are not proactive. And in uh, India, very recently we had this right to property, equal property for male and female children. So research has now shown that it is because of this particular right that people are uh, killing uh, women who marry outside the community because they do not want the wealth to be distributed and to go to someone outside the community. So earlier, there were inter-caste, inter-religious marriages happening. But it is now that these killings are happening, uh, particularly because of this. It is kind of related to the right to equal property. So these are things that we need to think about and see how uh, these can be connected. So we need to be proactive instead of reactive. Similarly, the preparedness instead of knee-jerk reaction, like with the COVID, we saw what's happening. We just did a research study about the commercial sex workers in India and how they were affected by the COVID and how they uh, uh, kind of got trapped in the debt trap. They took um, they borrowed money from the uh, brothel owners, from the managers, and then they ended up uh, paying so much more uh, interest. And that kind of interest extrapolated showed us that they would be in bondage with these brothel keepers for another uh, 10 years. And if not them, even their children would be drawn into this. So this kind of thing, we need to be prepared uh, so we uh, are aware of what is happening around us, what is the injustice happening around us. Similarly, we need to be proficient with the skills like the legislation, like the research. Whenever any policy change is required, we need to base and ask for the policy change based on research. So this is an area where we can work. We need to develop this, uh, doing these action researches so that we can put that forward and say, this is what is happening. So we need to do something like we did with the uh, research on commercial sex workers. We're asking the government now to give alternate professions for these women to uh, survive in times of crisis and otherwise. So also 
another very important thing is putting a resource directory together and uh, know how to network, who do we uh, call for a particular um, challenge that we face. So instead of uh, doing it at the last minute and kind of as, as an afterthought. So when we work, we see that in most of these Commonwealth countries and the developing countries, we have a system where the uh, victim is afraid to report the crime because these systems, the justice systems in these countries are offender friendly. They're not victim friendly at all. So we need to, if we want to end impunity, if we want to get the wrongdoer punished, we need to encourage the victim to report the crime. So without the first uh, call to 911 or, or 100, whatever it is, we, without that first call and without the first initial step that the victim takes, we cannot ensure justice. So there is a huge, uh, there are, there's a huge apprehension with this victim. How do we go into the system? And it's too complicated. I do not understand it. So many of these crimes go unreported. So this unreported, but, uh, these unreported crimes are the ones that give impunity to the offender. So we as uh, NGOs, as faith-based organizations, need to work with the victim, encourage them, take them through this justice system and ensure that they get justice. So when we're trying to work in this area to address gender-based violence, we have to understand that there are, there's a convergence of three factors that contribute to this gender-based violence. So if we need to ensure gender justice and if we need to strengthen gender justice, we need to work in all these three areas. When there is a suitable target, we need to work with the victim. When there is a motivated offender, our job is there. It's a huge challenge how to address his um, actions and how to see how we can rehabilitate him and uh, reform him. So that is another area. And of course, the uh, absence of capable guardians. And the, that capable guardians would be the society. How we fail to uh, stand up for the victim, how we fail to do our bit in helping the victim come out of this. So it's only when these three converge do you have this kind of uh, uh, gender-based violence. So we need to address these three uh, areas that we want to uh, uh, strengthen gender justice. So this was a routine activity approach that was given by Cohen and Fels and two researchers. So when we look at this motivated offender, we need to end impunity. We need to ensure that he is punished. So we need to uh, the certainty of punishment. It's not the severity of the punishment. We tend to think that if it's death sentence for rape, then people would not rape. But it's the uh, certainty, not the severity, is what we should understand. We need to make the offender accountable. We need to make him understand that crime does not pay. Gender-based violence does not pay. So we need to understand our role in, uh, in the prisons, working with uh, the, these offenders after the offense is committed so and prevent them also before uh, they really commit the crime. So uh, we need to work with uh, prospective criminals, if you may. And the suitable targets, we need to reduce their vulnerability. We need to uh, do the target hardening. We need to make them aware of their rights. We need to empower them to retaliate. We need to unlearn, like the Reverend was saying, we are socialized in a way to believe that uh, we have to be submissive, we have to be domesticated, we need to be tolerant. We are told that tolerance is a virtue. If you ask me, tolerance is a curse. So, And we are taught never to say no. So these are the things that we need to unpack, we need to unlearn. It's easier to learn something new, but learn, unlearning is a huge challenge. And we need to ensure that the, every woman is part of a group, a larger group, so there is safety in numbers, so she needs to uh, uh, be aware of that. And in India and in most of the other uh, developing countries in the uh, Asia Pacific region, we know that women, when they marry, they leave their home and move to their uh, husband's home. So they're in a place where there's nobody they know, no family, no friends. So they need the support of uh, other people. So we need to encourage the membership in these type of groups. And last but not the least, the society when there is an absence of uh, a capable guardian, when the society is not vigilant 
when the society distrusts the victim. We see many child sexual abuse cases when the victims are not believed, their stories are not believed. So, and you assume that there is consent, you try to blame the victim. So we need to understand that we, it is our role to say something whenever we see something. We need to understand that what's happening to someone else to, today might happen to us. So injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And this bystander apathy, again, this is what encourages the motivated offender to commit the crime. So we need to take care of that area as well. So we need to um, understand that uh, prevention and strengthening gen gender justice is everyone's business. So when you look and see how do you strengthen this gender justice, why does this gender-based crime happen, you understand that uh, three things can be the cause of it. One is the belief and the prestige, uh, prejudice, like uh, uh, Reverend Bhagwan was saying, that they're uh, doing something in the theological uh, area as well, trying to uh, remove these beliefs, false beliefs, and these notions, and remove the prejudice. So we need to change attitudes. So that is a huge challenge. The other things would be uh, governance failure and loopholes in the law. That can be done. We can amend the laws, we can reform the laws, we can uh, have administrative norms to tackle the government's failure. So these are things that we can handle. But coming to changing attitude, this is where it is a huge challenge and you cannot do it overnight or in a 20-minute uh, talk like um, uh, the Reverend was saying. So, And these beliefs, it's very important to understand how these beliefs affect our attitude and how these attitude determines our behavior. So it is interconnected. So we need to work on the beliefs, on the prejudices, change them, to change the attitudes, and to finally change the behavior of the offender. And coming to the laws, there are absolutely no dearth of laws. We have a lots of laws for everything. We, need, we have laws. But uh, uh, challenges, the political will to implement and enforce these legislation. And here is our role. We need to uh, be there as frontline professionals and public-spirited uh, faith-based organizations to monitor the enforcement. We need to uh, hold the hand of the victim through this journey, uh, searching for justice and ending impunity for the breach of laws. We need to uh, uh, increase reporting. Like I said, unless the victim reports, will there be uh, any uh, justice given? And that will be a uh, lesson for the future offenders as well. So certainty of punishment and not the severity of punishment. And so when we say there are no dearth of laws, we know that because of the CEDAW, because of the UDHR, uh, women's rights are um, human rights. And we have the sustainable developmental goals now, goal five and goal 16 to reduce um, gender-based violence. And we envisage a plan 50-50 by 2030, where men and women uh, have equal share in all the um, arenas of uh, life, and we are working together. So these are uh, the commitments that our governments have made. So we need to um, work on this. Since the governments have made these commitments, they have made a lot of laws in the country uh, in order to fulfill the commitment, the, the because they have ratified these uh, various treaties and these conventions. So we need to be there as faith-based NGOs, pushing them, nudging them to go and uh, uh, make this, uh, fulfill the commitment that they have made. All our constitutions talk about right to equality, all the human rights acts that we have talk about right to living with dignity. But most of us are familiar with these other things, but we are not familiar with this declaration on basic principles of justice for victims of crime. So this is another UN declaration that's been around and many countries have been using it to uh, make changes in their laws. In India, we recently introduced, introduced the word victim in the uh, legislation. We never had the word victim, like most other countries. So uh, these, this declaration is something that we need to look into. And it has a guide for policymakers. It tells us how do you go about strengthening the victim's hand and it has another handbook on justice for victims, which talks about the different types of victimization and the different types of assistance that a victim might need. So we need to understand that there is a national and international commitment. So now we need to step in and um, 
like I would say now, uh, gone are the days when we worked in uh, isolation. Now uh, time has come when we have a role to play in all these justice systems. So it's very crucial that we are participative in those uh, justice systems. We have the Juvenile Justice Act, which has uh, members of um, NGOs as uh, Juvenile Justice Board members. We have the Sexual Harassment Committee, which again requires for us to be there as um, NGOs, as members of the uh, Internal Complaints Committee for sexual harassment in the workplace. So all the churches, the uh, faith-based organizations, the system, the juvenile justice system, the justice system, the community, we need all to start working together. So we need a holistic approach to strengthen uh, gender justice. And uh, there is mandatory reporting now in most of the child abuse cases in uh, sexual abuse. So we need to understand how, what our role is as NGOs as members of the society to contribute to these systems to help the working of the system. So when you look at the whole justice system, you see that there is the lawmaking and the enforcement, which is the police and the judicial wing, which is the courts and the correctional wing, which is the prison. So in all these areas, we have a lot of scope to work uh, with the legislation. We as NGOs can uh, file public interest litigation in India. We have great experience with this PIL. The NGOs have taken the initiative, filed these PILs and got excellent uh, gender justice for the victims in India, uh, in starting from the sexual harassment at workplace and the Domestic Violence Act. There were a lot of victim-friendly legislations because the NGOs were part of the consultations. They worked with the government, with the lawmakers, to see, to ensure that the uh, needs of the grassroots people are addressed and submitting uh, memorandums to the Legislative Assembly. And we need, again, to have research to support our claim when we say that this is needed for domestic violence. You need to include sexual abuse, economic abuse, um, psychological abuse, these things. When you uh, say that, you need to have evidence to support it. So you need to focus on research as well. And with the enforcement, we need to help work with the police stations. We have all women police stations here in India where there is a lot of scope for social workers, counselors, legal advice, and people to be there with the victim and help her go through this very complicated process. And coming to the judicial wing, we can be there as amicus curiae, friend of the court, to uh, hold the hand of the victim, to help the victim through the mediation, the reconciliation, and whatever needs to be done for the victim because it's very traumatic to be in a court where you are going to face the offender eye to eye. So the victim needs the support. Otherwise, the victim just stays away from the court and then the uh, case is uh, uh, judged in favor of the accused because the victim turned hostile, the witness turned hostile. So all these areas is where we need to work to strengthen gender justice for the victim. So. In a nutshell, we, uh, we see that gender justice is a doable. With uh, all of us working together, it is a doable. And gender-based violence, it is predictable and preventable. And we need a long-term commitment and a follow-up. And we need this multi-pronged approach again. All of us, society, everyone working together. And the political commitment is very, very crucial to tackling this uh, violence. And promoting gender equality and equity is a crucial part as well, then the MDGs and the SDGs have made the government uh, in, uh, info, I mean, uh, uh, get the laws in place, but the hiccups are always in the implementation, and here's where we can step in. So we need to understand the replications of the new laws, and we need to do an impact evaluation and say, okay, this law needs to be amended because, amended because of this kind of uh, results we have from the impact evaluation studies that we've done. And we need to intervene to uh, uh, teach the community, to work with the community, to understand their rights and to unlearn their beliefs and the attitudes. Like I said, that's the uh, biggest challenge. And when we do this, instead of working with the elders in the community, we need to catch them young and work in the schools with the students because this is very effective when the children learn and they see with the role play, with different types of 
uh, tools we use to work with them and make them understand how to strengthen gender justice and how not to indulge in gender-based violence. Then the community interventions are very, very important as well. And the most important thing, we need to engage men. We usually tend to preach to the converted. Every Women's Day has only women and in the audience. So that will not help. We need to engage men and uh, use their, them and their uh, strength to help us overcome this uh, gender-based violence. And last but not the least, the media. That's a huge uh, source that we can use to alter the gender norm and promote equality. The gender is understood from the media to be uh, men are powerful, women are uh, subordinate to them. So we need, we can use the media as well to uh, help us uh, strengthen gender justice in this region. So finally, we need to move away from the red danger zone where the vulnerable are threatened with gender-based violence and there is no gender justice. We need to move to orange the world, progressing towards a prosperous and bright future free of violence for women. And finally, march forward together towards the goal of Planet 5050 by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much, Dr. Shekhar. That was another very inspiring um, talk. And I'm learning a lot today. And I've worked on I've worked on gender and gender issues for a few years now, but this has been gender-based violence is not one of my uh, forte and this is both have been very interesting thank you so much um are there any questions for uh dr shakar not in the in the comment not in the chat at the moment thank you okay we will be extending this uh or we're already extending it um but we will be extending this this meeting until we finish with a question and answer before we proceed to the to the pop meeting, no, uh, for for a few minutes. Um, I'm opening now for questions. Nothing. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Shekhar. So before we close, I just have to um, to synthesize some of the important points that we've learned today. And that was a lot of things there going on, no? And a lot of things that we can pick up. But I'm going to follow the format that Dr. Shekhar gave. We, we need to change the narrative, as what uh, Reverend James has mentioned, that we are equal, that even in the Bible, at the very, the original message was that what God created was good. And that includes both men and women. Um, we need to change that belief, that attitude uh, that we should embrace and recognize and affirm and celebrate uh, femininity and women in general. Uh, Dr. James, uh, Reverend James also said that we need to, women need to reclaim that space and embrace and pursue that. Uh, opportunities that we should have, you know? And that we are all, both men and women, are stewards of God's creation, and that dominion in this case, as what God has intended, is about the custodianship and stewardship. And it is both our right and our responsibility. Um, in, the, in the aspect, the governance aspect, you know, we make to we have to make uh, the government accountable of those actions against against women of, of of the abuse of the violence against women. We need to implement the laws that's already there, and we have a lot of laws. I mean, each country would have a lot of laws. Um, and then we need to end the impunity and increase increase the reporting of violations, which makes this all together is that. Gender-based violence is everyone's business, as what Dr. Shekhar has mentioned. It is the justice system's responsibility, and we are. It is their accountability. It is the faith-based organization's responsibility and accountability. It is the CSOs, and most of all, it's the local communities 
And in all of this, we need to advocate, we need to educate, we need to monitor, we need to be the role model, role model in in um, in advocating for uh, to stop gender-based violence. And how do are we going to do this? Is that we need to have the evidence to back us up and to learn from our mistakes, and then that we can make this world and we can make uh, women be in a better position where we are now. And this is an ongoing um, an ongoing uh, initiative for all of us, an ongoing responsibility for all of us. And once again, we would like to thank you, to thank Reverend James Bagwan uh, from Fiji and also Dr. Yula Shekhar for giving us a wonderful, wonderful talk. And I hope everyone has a good afternoon, evening, and also morning. And it has been a very inspiring uh, webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'll turn you over now to um, Joyce, yeah.